everyone for coming to our final uh, Digital Humanities Seminar of the semester. Um, today we have Andy Hedderman and Heather Tennyson, and Andy is Judith Harris Murphy, distinguished professor of art, art history. She's just finishing up her first uh, year at KU, uh, coming to us from um, University of Illinois uh, before this, and Heather Tennyson has her Master's in Art History and Library Science, and is also collaborating with Andy on this project, and they'll be speaking today on um, Digging Into Digging Into Data, which is a reference to the NEH Digging Into Data uh, grant program, and uh, they will be talking about one of the more challenging aspects of big data research, which is the communication and collaboration necessary to do that. So thanks for coming, and let's welcome you. We didn't even thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, I'll take the first shift, and then um, Heather will take the second. And um, you, you know us. You've, we've been introduced. I guess the way that I, what I'm going to do is this, the prehistory of the digging into data. Um, which is uh, some collaborative work that um, I undertook with these three people, or through the means of these three people. I gather um, that Kevin Franklin was here a week or so ago. Someone mentioned to me that they met him. But what happened is um, Peter Ainsworth is a, a, French, a professor of French, medieval French studies at uh, University of Sheffield. And we had invited him through medieval studies at the University of Illinois, which I was heading, to come and give a lecture to a, a group of, you know, in a conference we were doing. Um, and when he came, he had, um, on his own, was, was very interested in Froissart. He's like Mr. Froissart, the French historian in, in the world. And so he had managed, and this is quite a feat for any of you, especially people in libraries know that this is quite a feat. He had managed to persuade six or seven major libraries in Europe to let him come in with his own photographer and completely digitalize manuscripts of Froissart. So he would get grants, do the photography, and then at Sheffield, he had created a website where he mounted these images. Um, and he was interested, he and I hooked up at various conferences, and he wanted me to do some work with the Fassar manuscripts as an art historian, some sort of traditional art history. Um, and so when he came to campus, because of his, his sort of interest in his digital archive he was building and the ways he was going to shape it, he wanted to meet Kevin Franklin, who I had never met, <laughs> but who was at my institution um, as the head of Illinois Center for Computing and Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences. And essentially what Kevin did as this head was, uh, at least one of the, the, the side of him that I saw, which was in which he excelled, was he tried to get to know the humanities faculty on the campus and what they worked on. He tried to get to know the computer scientists on the campus. And then he tried to match you up. You know, so he was talking to me just briefly. Peter was there. Peter was talking to him about a project. And he talked to me and said, what do you do? And he said to me, you've got to meet Peter, I never pronounced his name right, Achi. I collaborated for three years, and I always said, hi, Peter. <laughs> so Peter B. You've got to meet Peter B., um, who is this amazing scientist and who would be very interested in, he's interested in the visual arts, you know, he's interested in collaboration, you should get together. So I did. Uh, Peter B. and I had a long coffee one day where he told me what he did, I told him what I did, he asked me questions, I asked him questions, and we kind of gradually converged on um, a potential idea for um, research. And so this is basically the, the problem that I brought up that he found interesting. Um, I'm very interested in the medieval Parisian book trade, which involves all kinds of people, scribes, painters, booksellers, authors, etc. And as an art historian, what I was interested in was where does the, um, where the artists come in? You know, and, and what role do they play? How free are they to do what they want to do? I mean, my understanding and my real sense is that, you know, everything got laid out, a little hole left at the page, and that's when the artist came in. You know, so it's not like they're saying, make a picture, I want, I want to paint big one this time. You know, it's more like, here's the hole for you to fill in with the text, you know, put your picture there. And so one of the issues is, okay, so how, what could we do to understand these anonymous artists as individuals or as contributors? to the book trade was my sort of uh, idea. And so that was one of the challenges. And then a challenge for Peter was to understand what it was in the real life object that I looked at that we could use a digital surrogate to analyze 
and to get something true about that at an object. So you know, the digital image is not the same as the real manuscript page. And so what can you do with a digital image that would let you get to it? And so um, this opportunity, collaborative opportunity appeared, and we had this potential to do things. Um, and so in a sense, what we wanted to do was to come up with ways that you could use the digital surrogates, the photographs, to do something. Um, and then to, in, in, a, in the process, to sort of come up with something that scholars could use. So like another tool, not the end, end resource or end point of you know, your research, but something that would help you in your research questions. Um, and so we wanted to try to leverage you know, what was available. So you know, in part, of, part of what we focused on, and I'm going to show you two examples of art because I just can't help it, <laughs> to give you an idea of what it was we were looking at. Um, you know, in the period that I study, artists, they were conservative and innovative. And the conservation came in the fact that usually the way artists would work, you know, you got paid by the piece. So you would collect good ideas and then you'd recycle them and deploy them in different ways. You know, you would never sit down and say, oh, I'm going to make a totally new image here. You know, I'm going to take two days to paint this painting. You'd be like, okay, let's see, I've got this, 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 and we're proved together in this new way. And so artists would collect ideas like this rare sketchbook where you can see things range from, um, me on here. So they range from like heads, collecting pictures of heads. Okay, I won't. Upper left, reflections of heads. Lower down here, you've got things like um, campus leaves and halves of bodies. The head wasn't interesting, it was just the drapery. And so they would collect these kinds of things. And then they would come up with um, compositions often working from little drawings. And so what I show you here is the black and white thing is a marginal drawing that exists in the bottom of a manuscript page. It should have been erased by scraping, but they didn't do it. And I have four different images that were made by four different artists using this idea. Um, they all saw, obviously, variants on the drawing where they had variants of the drawing in their collections. But what is interesting is to sort of look at the basic drawing, um, and I use the pointer to point at it. Its features are, there's this man who is leaning on a stick you can see his arms, you can see the arms crossed, you can see the stick. And if you look at the top of his head, you can see little lines coming out, which are a crown. So he's a king. And then you can see that there's some landscape, like there's sort of mountains to the right, and there's these two lollipop type things, which are trees. And so the artist knows they have to do a landscape, a man in a landscape with a stick with a crown on his head, and he's got a little bag on his back. And so artist number one doesn't do the arms crossed, because the guy's hiking. And so but he doesn't quite let go of the arms crossed position. And so the man is holding a stick. If you've ever hiked, as I will be doing in July, you never hold your walking stick like that. It doesn't help you. Uh, oops, so I went forward. This is what I do. Uh, artist number two got the hike right. Artist number three got the hike right. Artist number four, who's the last in the sequence, kind of goes back to the idea of leaning on the stick. So you've got, you know, in a sense, what this shows you is, yes, if you were iconographically going to describe the scene, you would say king in landscape, you know, hiking in landscape uh, with a bag on his back. But the artists have all done it in different ways. And so, in a sense, what you've got here then is the idea of you know, these kinds of models. This is kind of the conservative side of things. You know, there's that. But then, what does the individual artist contribute? Well, sort of the safest thing to say is that what they do is they vary these conservative comp compositions and then the way they paint them. So like the style, the way they mix colors, they layer the colors, they build the colors up, the effect that has visually are, is sort of the original thing that, that they will contribute. And so um, this gives you an idea of, you know, in a sense, although I said the digital doesn't really copy, this is photography through a microscope of a tree in the background of a painting. And the thing I like about it, especially the one on the left, is that you can actually see the pigments laying over each other. So in a sense, the real life manuscript page is almost 3D. You know, it has a built up surface. Um, the color comes shining through, the back colors shine through the front colors um, and mix in various ways. You know, little glazes go on top and actually um, sort of modify them. And so in a sense, in talking to Peter about this and showing him pictures <laughs> and you know, discussing with him what we were doing, is we decided that what we wanted to do was try to focus on these ideas of, you know, maybe an idea of shape, fake shapes, and an idea of color um, as collected in different digital collections. So we were trying to come up with ways that you could maybe analyze these whole manuscripts that are now being digitized and made put on, up on the web by people like Gallica and at the BN or by 
British Library digitized manuscripts, or even the individual images that the Bien in Paris puts up on their Mandragore collection. So that's what we started looking at. So we, um, fortunately, because of our friend Peter Ainsworth, had one beautifully well thought out pre-planned collection where the digital images had all been photographed by the same man using the same equipment at the same uh, DPI, so the same resolution, with the same lighting systems, and although we did it in different rooms at these different museums, that's about as close as you can get to a control group. And so um, those had been produced for Peter for his website, but he also had um, both the processed and the unprocessed images, and he made those all available to us too. So we had the ones that had been fixed for the website, and then we had the ones that just were all the results of the photography. Um, so there's this consistency, there's a corpus of images, it ended up being, I don't know, nine different manuscripts. Um, so like, each manuscript had about 400 pages, each manuscript had at least 20 to 40. So like 125 images we had to work with, and you know, if we wanted to do other things, zillions of pages. And so um, we used that as our resource, and then we um, started to do this. We had our, our, our approach. I had looked at two of the manuscripts in person and had done the sort of art historical stylistic story that you do for, as a background to the what I see as the more interesting kinds of studies. But you have to do it, so you know how the book is put together. And so um, we decided that I was, so I was number one. I had already looked at two of these books. I knew how many artists were in there, where they worked, what they did, you know, things like that. Um, and so what we uh, did to come up with these artists, or to tease them out, was to do what I write down here as this number one. You, you look at um, you know, different things. You assume that artists will do certain things the same all the time, especially if they're tree money. So they'll always draw noses looking the same. They'll always make the eyes look the same. You know, they might make the face pudgier or more narrow, but there are certain things that will stick. So in a sense, you have that sort of shape type thing that works. Um, you also have, as I said before, color. Um, and the qualities of paint that, that's put on. You know, different artists will mix paint in different ways because they mix it themselves. They will put it on in different layers. It will have a different visual effect. So skin tones by one guy will look different from skin tones by another guy. So in a sense, we wanted to try to do with the color and do the gesture. And so um, here's a plug for uh, what, what they came up with. This is um, open source, an open source tool that was devised by the NCSA, or National Center for Super Computing Applications, at the University of Illinois, and if you Google this I am to learn um, sort of acronym that they have, you get to their website, and if you want to download it and play with it, you can. Um, and so this is a tool that could be used for a number of different things. What we were using it for um, was to uh, look at color. And so this is a little, you know, this may be, well, you may know this already, but basically, um, artists use different color combinations, as I said, um, our sense of color is different from our sense of brightness. A digital image's color is different from a real live painting's color. And so um, the tool that I just showed you lets you analyze digital images in different kinds of color spaces. There are many of them. The one we found good is the so-called HSV, which basically tracks hue, which is the term for pure color. So it's like this, um, on this little chart, it is, let me see if I've got this right, it's like going well, it's blue, it's green, it's whatever. It's the wheel part at the top, slice. So the color wheel. Um, saturation is how intense it is. So if you look at this color wheel, like look at the top, the center is the least saturated, the outer edge is the most saturated. So that really vibrant blue is very highly saturated. And then value is lightness or darkness. Ah, and so it's like the bottom of the cone up to the top of the cone. So one of the things we wanted to look at was that these features in our pigments as used in different parts of the painting. The other thing that we wanted to look at, and this is still, this is before the digging into data, this is the preliminary grounds. <laughs> I'm almost done with that. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at was shape. And this was something that actually ended up being very promising. Um, it had to do with the fact that, you know, every artist will do certain things in a formulaic way. The nose. You know, if you look at these two men in front of the, the castle, you can perhaps see they have similar noses. They both have mouths that turn down, their eyes are similar. You know, so there's that. But there's also elements of architecture, repeated patterns, in the architectural shape, or even, and you know, even more dramatic if you're dealing with histories of kings, <laughs> crowns. <laughs> you know, crowns are sort of a fixed thing, you know, and, and artists have ideas of what these look like and what their shapes are. Um, and so we did some uh, sort of collaborative material with, um, I worked in this one with one of Peter's research assistants who was a mathematician, a female mathematician, Mar Marianne Mosoni. 
um, who got her MA in math and who came up with a method. She was very excited. She listened really carefully and was excited about the idea of the shape issues. And so she came up with a mathematical algorithm um, for analyzing shape based on distances between points. You know, and, and apparently you could kind of look, you could crop out what you're looking at, the crowns, do this mathematical analysis in the, the image of the crown, and it would give you a number that could be graphed, and you could sort of fit paintings together and sort of come up with similarities. So it was actually quite productive. And here's an example of the collaboration aspect that's part of our theme of this, is that she got her MA in life. <laughs> and so it was like, goodbye, Maria. <laughs> you know, goodbye, algorithm. <laughs> and so it had great potential. And it actually comes back in the digging into data in a different form. But um, you know, in a sense, that avenue of research ended. And what we ended up doing then is um, a new computer grad, computer grad science research assistant came in to work with Peter uh, Vinci. And what he was interested in um, was starting a research project. Peter was moving into what's called polygonal analysis. So it's sort of shapes, not necessarily points, but more like the two-dimensional shaping. Um, and so the new graduate student, Tenzing, um, was interested in that. And so with that, we finally moved to digging into data and you get Heather. With the shift over into our new graduate student, we also were folded into a much larger project. And so the Digging Into Data project as a whole was not just answering questions of authorship within um, individual cultural um, objects, but also was looking at the collaborative project as a whole. And it's multi-institutional, as you can see, multidisciplinary, and um, with many numerous people who were spread out all over the place having different ideas. And so it became a much bigger kind of collaboration. And that's actually kind of the more interesting thing that I think we're going to end up talking about today. So why do we care about authorship? I mean, within our context, we were interested in trying to find individual artists within these different books to identify illuminators so that we could gauge um, agency, possibly, and um, begin to develop corpuses for individual artists. But um, it's not just manuscripts now. We also um, were looking at, um, I'm sorry, looking at quilts and looking at maps and so looking at quilts and looking at maps and seeing if we can devise these tools and these algorithms that can then be shared across different platforms and across different types of collections to get very different types of results using the same tool sets. And so here you can see um, kind of an example of the different kinds of materials that we were using. So to begin this process, we actually had to develop a memorandum of understanding. And this was signed at an institutional level so that, um, so that it kind of facilitated trust and camaraderie among the different institutions. Because especially when you think about um, academics in general, it's very siloed. And people are very protective of their collections and of their intellectual property. And within this collaboration, there really needed to develop a level of trust amongst, um, amongst colleagues who do not know each other. I mean, so, obviously Andy had a previous relationship with Peter Ainsworth, and Peter Ainsworth had a relationship with others, but then we're bringing in other individuals who don't have a relationship, and all of a sudden everyone's having to trust each other, not just with their data sets and their algorithms and their software, but also with drafts of documents that we're producing together as a whole. And so, you know, mass amounts of, um, of editing were done. So again, this idea of authorship being challenged, not only with the individuals within the cultural objects that we're developing, but also who wrote the sentence inside of a paper that's being presented that's been edited by five different people. Oh, well, maybe I should go back for a second. So here you can see image sharing, knowledge sharing, software sharing, and then it's all kind of within this greater understanding that we're going to share these types of resources and we're going to be happy about it. Also, oh, there was a, a cloud made to do this stuff in this right. is uh, Michigan, Illinois, and England. Right. So there had to be a communication and big places to put big stuff. Right. So here you can see kind of the logistics of it. 
So the institutions and the funding, all of these things were shared resources. Um, legal and ethical aspects, so copyright, again, was shared copyright and, um, and shared authorship of papers. The data was shared, software was shared, hardware was shared, and so again, this kind of all gets back to the funding. And then finally, the knowledge was shared amongst all of us, and, and everyone was then given full rights to the, the knowledge that was kind of generated as a collective team. So while there's all of this collaboration and authorship in kind of the meta sense, there's still a research project being done. And in actuality, there were three research projects being done. So kind of pattern-driven classifications with the quilts, which was coming out of the University of Michigan, and they were trying to devise crazy versus non-crazy quilts. Um, the knowledge of cartographers of early French and British maps, which was coming out of the English department at the University of Illinois. And then artistic and scribal hands, which is a meshing of both the work that Andy had previously done and was continuing to do, as well as Peter Ainsworth's project in Sheffield, which was looking at scribal hands, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here you can see the types of data sets that were being shared, and images were all readily available to anybody. So if Andy had wanted to do quilts, she could have pulled quilts images down and, and analyzed them and compared them in, in, in some way. But you know, overall, these, group, these groups, which are so different, are all sharing one very similar quality, which is anonymity amongst the artists. And so this idea of kind of parsing out authorship amongst all of these different um, different collections. So the software sharing, again, we all were using the im to learn software package, which was open source. And um, the models within im to learn were being further developed as we were going along. So while Andy and I were working with Tenzing to kind of get at things that we needed and were working, because all of the actual analysis was done by the humanists, not by the computer scientists. So they created the software packages for us, and they obviously wrote the algorithms that were driving everything, but the day-to-day -day, um, kind of clicking and moving around of things to get the data points was all done by the humanists. And, and mostly by the... And mostly by, by the grant researchers. <laughs> 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 but that's okay. Yeah. Um, and so, obviously, issues were coming up on usability. And so, again, this kind of comes to this idea of being able to talk to individuals from a very different um, kind of core concentration and base of knowledge, and things that you would think are, you know, of course, why wouldn't you have this? They were questioning, why would you need this? And so there was kind of getting beyond the talking above each other to the point that we could actually kind of collaborate together so that the tool became more user friendly and um, more streamlined. And so here you can see that similar types of analysis that we use in the manuscripts, and again, we'll get into this a little bit later, such as kind of um, masking out shapes were also used in map analysis to, uh, well, what they were doing was actually um, measuring bodies of water inside of maps to gauge accuracy amongst French and English map makers. So who's who's making the more accurate maps? And, and so here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you care about accuracy? The algorithms were being shared. And this was a very big deal for the computer scientists to actually trust their algorithms to others. And so again, this trust that was being built really allowed for both tweaking of algorithms between all of the computer scientists and the math people who were involved in this project, and to get them so that you know uh, algorithm that's being used to identify the edges of a scribal hand are also being used to identify areas inside of a quilt or in a map, and then actually kind of coming to different end results based off of that, but still getting that the edge detection. Knowledge sharing was actually done in weekly meetings, and so instead of just having regular collaborations where you know you'd have a um, phone in the middle of a of a table, we actually used a special software program developed with Microsoft called Uvo, and everyone could see each other, and so it was all video conference with with a bank of individuals on a screen. So here you can see this guy's in Sheffield. This one's in Michigan. This is the um, NS 
see people or the supercomputing center where I would be sitting, and I always make sure that I sat off camera. You could just see my leg kind of pumping in the background. But um, and then everything was recorded so that individuals who worked at the meeting would be able to go into MetaChi, which was our shared resource, and then download them and watch the video or what, you know cruise the notes that were being taken, and then contribute based off of um, that back into the group on uh, the server. So constant collaboration, constant talking, and the ability to see each other. And you could almost fake making eye contact with people. Again, kind of fostered this trust and this um, kind of feeling of camaraderie so that the harder aspects of the job, such as editing someone's sentence who's an English major, you know, <laughs> were a little bit easier. So results that came about the project that kind of are outside of the more social dynamics are um, that the photographers were able to look at the um, at the different Great Lakes and then come out and say that even though the French were in the Great Lake region longer than the British, the British had better maps and were able to really realize you know how great the Great Lakes were in size. Whether or not that changes, I don't know, but you know. Um, more interesting, at least for me and Andy, <laughs> is the um, scribal hand analysis that was happening in the University of Sheffield. And so what we thought was really interesting is that because of the edge detection that they were doing, so they're looking specifically for specific types of letters that individual scribes, again, because gestures are all very going to be common for each individual, looking for kind of um, telltale letters. Hallmark. So your writings are very different. You can see between Brian's scribe and the other scribe, even though the script looks fairly similar. And so by going through and actually kind of desaturating the um, image and finding just the edges and then applying the algorithm to those edges, they can do that for whole banks of books that are, doc that are um, digitized online and then do a rough sort. And so in this instance, this isn't obviously a final result. The results that are going to be shot out say these pages are you know, this scribe and these pages are this scribe. It's more, these pages may be this scribe or are very similar, so that a paleographer or um, an art historian who's looking at, you know, the way that books are being produced has a rough cut that they can then focus on and parse even fuller yeah. using their, you know, expertise. So instead of looking at 400 two-sided pages with full of script, you know, you, you kind of get a clump and you can check a few and then you can Right. So here you can see that the computer <laughs> looked at the edges and then have been able to pull out images that are like, and that's the, that's the goal for this. So it's very exciting, and yeah, I think really this, this is going to be good because it doesn't. The well, quality, millions of letters in a manuscript where right. it's 23 mini miniatures. Right. And so the quality of the images is not as important as what we would have to do for color analysis. So you could do a black and white image just as well as you could do a color image and for this study and be able to still have a relatively good comparison going back and forth. It's very exciting. But here's ours. And so we were really looking, again, at um, the artistic hands. And then specifically, we were looking at faces. But even more specifically, we were looking at facial tone. And so here you can see two different artists that were found inside of two different manuscripts. And so these were considered our test group. And so using a similar um, technique to the edge detection, we had developed a ball-based um, Sort of like an imaginary ball Segmentation. Around, so it's kind of like balls. Photoshop when you go in and you use the magic wand. Very similar to that. And so here you can see that the automatic is really looking only for those colors that are within, or the qualities of the color that are within the, um, the flesh tone. And so taking out the blacks of the outline or the rosiness of the cheeks so that we were looking for what was kind of more pure of the color. And then a mask was generated based off of, um, of that segmentation and then placed over the images, which could then be converted inside of the color space. So the averages then, which are taken off of this HSV, so few saturation value, <laughs> remember the cone, which are really looking not at the 
the color of the paint itself, but at the characteristics of the color, like how much light is coming through the color, you know, all the rest of those things that Andy discussed earlier, are being analyzed and a data point is generated based off of these things. And because of the masking, we're only looking specifically at the skin tone. And we can't see it. Can I turn the lights? And then the results are actually graphed in MATLAB, which meant that an art historian had to learn how to use MATLAB, which was not very exciting. Anyway, trust us, there's a, it's a three-dimensional kind of graphic. There's a very clear cluster of dots that correlate to the hand. Yeah, so there's a yeah. saturation coming saturation hue and then sticking up straight is the value thing and when you graph these in 3D you get like a swarm. Yeah. You know, and the, the swarm again it, it gives you an approximation that right. you can identify those artists' hands. Right. And in one manuscript, you know, it's you, I can do it myself. <laughs> you know. But if I were looking across like workshops and trying to look at 30 or 40 manuscripts or hundred manuscripts, you know, that might have come out of Paris at a certain moment. To be able to do this would really give you, again, streamline the steps, give you a, a jump off. Right. But one of the Sorry, issues that we no, that's okay. one of the issues that we found was that it really took this consistently um, applied methodology for image capture in order to get results that were believable <laughs> and legitimate. And so we we have slides we can talk about it later if we want to. We had actually done a control image and then manipulated the image in a lot of different ways, reducing DPI, reducing file size, you know, doing it as screen captures and stuff, and it really altered the way that the HSV was being read. And so to, 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 to attempt to do a larger project, kind of like what the scribal hands could do across libraries and across digital collections would be impossible. And so really, it's, this kind of analysis would only be good for one book that had been um, consistently book. photographed by one institution and then throughout that. And again, it only really should be considered for a rough sort because the kind of sort the art historian needs to still go in and verify and parse out final things. So here we go. Our newest set of computer legible parameters kind of makes for this kind of post-human idea of authorship. And it, it kind of gives us new ideas for how we can go about leveraging these collections of digital images um, for purposes of gaining a broader idea of who is behind these materials. So for color spaces, for spatial characteristics such as, you know, polygonal fitting, and um, the accuracy of cartography, cartographers, and so it just kind of, these ideas were things that we hadn't really thought of before, and so this idea we hope is going to end up kind of opening up new avenues for, for different people to kind of share ideas, and through that sharing, come up with new and innovative ways to look at things. I think what was interesting that came out of it is that, you know, when you look across these three very different data sets, you know, three, made at three different times, three different places, different media, and hand sewn quilts, printed maps, hand painted manuscripts. And there were things that rose above, right? Um, and that was actually ended up being one of the most exciting things, uh, particularly because our we had chosen one of the most difficult of color, and you know, in a sense, the results are were worthwhile, but right. so specialized, I guess, one manuscript at a time that you know it's not going to be globally useful. Thing that we did. But the, the scribal hands, as Heather said earlier, is really exciting for people. And it could, I imagine, be used for typeface and early printed books mm -hmm. and for all kinds of um, objects that you know were produced at certain moments in certain certain places, excuse me. Um, so that was really quite exciting. Um, and yeah, there you go. And you're all let me do this one. <laughs> Project, what we really realized was that good collaboration is challenging and that it really takes individuals talking to each other and not above each other and that sometimes the obvious really needs to be stated because someone else isn't seeing it as being anything that's really obvious 
and you're not really going to get what you want out of a collaboration unless you ask for it or really describe why you need it. So a lot of times there's just the disconnect and this project really taught us that there needs to be some sort of open, trusting communication in order to end up with really great results. And there were two other things it taught us, if I'm going to remember them both. Um, I mean, the one is, at least from my standpoint, is the importance, for, for me, I, it might be that what I really enjoyed was actually getting in the mind and sort of thinking about the questions that computer science people ask and having someone very intelligent from a very different field look at what I did and sort of ask me questions about it, and then you know have me look at what he and his students did, and you know have me ask them questions. And it was partly getting to know each other, but it was also sort of getting to understand how things work, mm -hmm. um, and then finding through compromise mm -hmm. the thing that would interest me that would interest him. Right. You know what will move his whole lab for? Because he had to sort of support all his students on grants. You know, so like I, he couldn't just do anything. You know, it had to be something that had applications way beyond our history. You know, defense or something like that. But, but I think that you know, often in digital humanities, it's not necessarily that, that initial step is not necessarily taken. It's more like, I want you to do work for me. You know, I'm in charge or not. And so for us, you know, because this is really the way we did it, it's the way we enjoyed it. You know, I don't know if I would find it different. But I think that was one thing I learned that I think is worth trying to replicate or trying to find projects that move whole groups of people forward, mm -hmm. serving their different needs. And you know, it's hard. It takes a lot of time up front. I mean, we spent like, I mean, I had one year as a national NCSA faculty fellow, and then a year on an NSF, and then we got to the digging into data group thing. So there was a couple of years of doing stuff in various ways before ours. So that was one thing. The other thing is, and this might be, might be on the next slide, I don't know, but I wanted to emphasize it, is that, um, and you know, this group probably would agree, but that there needs to be, for people who do, Really good digital humanities collaboration. There needs to be an accommodation in the tenure process. I mean, people have to value this kind of research as not being an add-on, but as being something that is really useful to the humanities disciplines, and I think, and to the science disciplines. Because you know, for you know, my colleague Peter, I think the first grant we got from the NSF was like twenty thousand dollars. Wow! You know, I don't, that's hardly anything. You know. I can't take on too many grants like this. <laughs> I would take on many things like this. I would be so happy. But it was interesting to sort of find that. So the tenure thing, though, is, is something that I think is very, very important. And that, um, you know, especially because it seems to me, you know, as, as someone who's more mature scholar, you know, that, that um, you know, I can go out and spend three years working on these things. Um, you know, and it's good for me. But if I were coming up for tenure and I did this, because that, but, but someone at that position who's grown up you know, in this environment is the person who should be doing it. And so I really think that that's something that, um, you know, I, I don't like to, well, I had to say it, but, I, but I'd like to see, see people working on this campus, let's say, to make sure that that happens. It might happen, I don't know. But it's an important thing because it will, otherwise it stymies the collaboration in the digital humanities that might not let people do it in a way that will maximize the uh, results, which I think is, you know, if you're going to do it, do it well. It's a great argument. You know, and, and it may be possible for people to do it well. So, good thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Um, so, basically, none of this would have been possible without our numerous granting agencies, all of the librarians and um, photographers who um, digitized all of the images for us, and then obviously the virtual vellum site. Um, especially Peter Ainsworth and Mike Meredith. So, and then, I mean, if you'd be interested, I don't know, we were pretty quick there. Yeah. We do have sort of outtakes. We have, um, and if you'd be interested in this, let me know. But we have, for instance, okay, um, the, the experiment that Heather did um, with one manuscript image and then kind of going through different ways of accessing it, processing it, Taking it through, um, and then yeah. seeing you know what that does to um, the final product. And we kind of came to this because our colleagues working on quilts were being very naive about color, um, while we were you know back in the guys, over here. Um, and so we wanted to you know we wanted to sort of show them something, but then also there was some computer science.
scientists who are interested in, um, sort of, uh, in a sense, trying to get broad access. You know, what can you do with Google? Right. You know, Google yeah. searches, right. Wikipedia images. And so some of them were trying to do scientific studies with those and were kind of ignoring this particular point. So in a way, it was a, kind of a passive-aggressive yeah. move on Heather's <laughs> part. <laughs> but I thought you I could talk about it a little if you wanted to hear about it. I mean, yeah, but and it was real, what was most interesting was the response from the computer science people who some of them had mass papers that were out that were utilizing Google images that were not the correct color and were doing it on a full RGB color analysis. And we were looking at them saying, that's not what that looks like, and that's just not true. And so what we did was, and again, you can't really see it. I'll have to have <laughs> So we went through and did lossy versus lossless to see what the difference is. And obviously, it's, it's a subtle. What do you think what lossy and lossless <laughs> I know that JPEG is lossy and JPEG 2000 is lossless and TIFFs are lossless and it's a matter of compression of the digital image. And so the sub there's a lot of subtleties. This isn't as dramatic uh, a slide as you would really think, but when, um, when you take into account the number of images that you're really looking at and if each one is, is kind of going off of a different thing depending on on um, where it's at. So if, if, you're, looking at TIFF, if you're looking at TIFF, <laughs> if you're comparing a TIFF to a JPEG image, and you know that the JPEG image is going to be off by at least two to three data points, and you have a large number of these kinds of things that are who knows which way they're going, you're going to end up having some corrupted data in the end, and you can't really make valid comparisons. And so that's really what we're showing. These two little clusters that are way yeah. You know, in that 3D right. scale. And what you really can see is that in this cluster up here, they are literally on top of each other. And so it's just hundreds of these dots that are just on top of each other right near our control as compared to kind of very types of compression of the JPEG files which are scattered around over here. And those are all those EPEDs. Yes, these are all the same EPEDs, the same masking and everything. And then here we did different kinds of captures. So we did screen captures in, at different resolutions of the screen because, again, this is a very common art historical, you know, yeah. way to get yeah. your yeah. images is ah, you kind of you know, <laughs> go to your data bank and then do a screen capture. And you know, how we wanted to see how the screen capture really goes compared to everything. So again, you just kind of have our control image there. And then again, here are the JPEGs. And then our screen captures are far off. And then this one is actually showing the different ways that you could find images. So we have Wikipedia image, a scan slide, the institutional website screen capture, so a screen capture from their website. And then here's our control. And you can see that all of these different um, versions of the same image, which, if we go back here, look more or less similar. I mean, there are some variations, but the but the resulting um, HSV color spaces and because of the quality was just enormous. And so the idea that this could be applied across you know a large range of image types was just not possible. And so then, finally, we looked at processed versus unprocessed images. If you have the same image, and this is, again, from virtual vellum, and they processed it to color correct, obviously looking at the manuscript to make sure that the color that's represented inside the digital scan is going to accurately represent the color within the manuscript. But that processing dramatically alters the HSV reading. So if you have one processed image and one unprocessed image, and you're trying to cross-compare, the unprocessed image is are all down here and sort of forward and forward so like, and then the <laughs> process ones are up there and they don't even you can't cross correlate so you couldn't take these and just move them up and have a direct relationship so yes yeah, so in a sense it was uh, what we've demonstrated <laughs> it's very hard to deal with color <laughs> in the reproductions of images go to shape yeah and then, but that there are really um, potential major developments Mm -hmm. and, uh, sort of, uh, 
streamlining research processes for humanists in this. Um, and Peter B., who was my collaborator, has now gone on to the NIH, so I think he was very successful in all the work that he did with us and, of course, everybody else he worked with at uh, NCSA. So it was, in a sense, a very good experience for us. <laughs> I mean, at Illinois, I had one of my 
my first, my first PhD, my very first PhD, um, uh, got a PhD and then uh, went to like got an MLS and is now uh, tenured in the in the library mm -hmm. in Illinois. And her publications for tenure were half art history mm -hmm. and half library. Mm -hmm. And library was happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, and but but I'm thinking, you know, in art history at least, mm -hmm. you know, so it's half digital humanities, half, mm -hmm. you know, art history. I'm not sure we would have been. And so I mean, it's, it's sort of thinking along those lines of, you know, with institutional collaborations mm -hmm. and institutional products or, you know, group products, mm -hmm. how do we evaluate group products? How do we evaluate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something that is, I think yeah. these are questions, you know, that have just long gone to humanities yeah. because yeah. I feel yeah. it's just the individual rather than group. Yeah. Um, you know, it tends to valorize the, the uh, single author monogram. Um, so, uh, so, so I think that what we have here is, you know, is a completely, it's a different, completely and it's, it's, it's a different, different field, but it's, it's yeah. one that just like, you know, just like interdisciplinary work in humanities, uh -huh. I think this is, uh -huh. you know, it's a big yeah. umbrella. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. You know, and it covers more people, yeah. absolutely. And, and so I think there were like 20 authors on papers at Yeah, and then that was when we all went, well, no, we don't, you know, we should be thanked. Yeah. You know, you can't have 20 authors. And this ever explained me, you know, how else in life. So I guess one of my questions also is why aren't these uh, why aren't these libraries uh, talking to each other mm -hmm. and proposing a project and cut out the literary middleman? I mean, why? I think it's the boundaries. You know, I mean, it's yeah. really interesting because um, I've been talking to the British Library uh -huh. and the people because for uh, for two years um, Peter Ainsworth and the head of the British Department at Illinois and I. Uh, for two successive NEH calls for um, you know, digital projects. Uh -huh. We put in this project to digitize this particular manuscript in London and use it as core uh -huh. for, you know, yeah. Yeah. working on yeah. 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 idea yeah. around it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they always thought it was a great idea, um, but it was always the institution signing off, so, you know, mm -hmm. our, our NEH would be doing would be saying, Next week we'll have the permission from the British Library saying that we can do this, you know. But it would come in time. It never came in time. Um, and so, you know, I went to see him recently, and you know, they are now digitizing all manuscripts, and they digitize this one themselves, and they put it up. And I said, well, hey, you know, you've got this institution. Would you be open to collaborations now? And he said, actually, this is what we're looking for. We're putting we're putting our whole manuscripts out there, and, you know, and we want. This thing. So there's nothing that would stop this the British Library mindset on this particular head of manuscripts. You know, the head of the manuscripts at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris from coming and saying, hey, we've got, a, you know, we've got one for like that. You know, so I, I think that might, but the thing is, their mandate in their jobs is very much their own collection. You know, it's, it's creating knowledge, but it's also curating, preserving, making it accessible. And so my sense is with them, it's like a second level thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll have to say that someone like me, you know, my primary research myself on myself, my scholarly mm -hmm. study is first. Mm -hmm. You know, and then this kind of collaborative thing, which I find very, it's a different kind of thinking, different kind of learning, I find really good. Mm -hmm. You know, so that would be second. But I actually talked to them about them, because I want to do this with your partner. Mm -hmm. You can think the British person, yeah, the British people would love it. Because they could use it to point to it and say, look what we're doing. We've generated knowledge, we put this out there, and now we have this, we have spurred the scholarly body mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, into action. You know, I can say, hey, I went to them, look what they did. Yeah, so we have to get by it. I think it might be moving towards that, but I, but, I, but I think it's, it just takes someone for whom it's central at, you know, even at a given moment. And I'm not sure institutions will find it to be central to be collaborating and making. <laughs> I think. Do you think that I 
that are inherently that are inherently comparative frameworks. So um, you know, women's history is a is a comparative kind of framework. Uh, feminist movements, industrialization, work. Um, this point I may have told you about that I was. Um, uh, I wouldn't go as far as I collaborated, but I was invited to go to the University of Leeds. Mm -hmm. And our funding didn't come through, but part of the project they were working on was the Marks and Spencer Archive that's recently been deposited there. And the, you know, part of why I'm here today is to think about ways we could reframe the project because the, the sort of output was going to be, I was going to go around and give lectures. Well, I mean, if the output could be something that's more comparative mm -hmm. about industrial workers or service sector workers in the US and, and, and Britain, and we get it up online, I mean, it would seem that would have a far greater impact mm -hmm. than me going around giving some lectures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And which, you know, maybe it's also my like work for next year, year after, with this manuscript from the libraries, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a phenomenal, unusual, you know, big manuscript, so it's very strange. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, there's nothing really but it was made in Rouen, mm -hmm. where there were lots of manuscripts made. Mm -hmm. um, and it contains texts that are in other manuscripts everywhere. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, and it belonged to a man yeah. who well, actually was given to Margaret of Anjou, so it, mm -hmm. someone who married and became queen of England. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little pods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And our idea was to sort of have that be an anchor. So it be like the, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the archive. And, and we were thinking of looking at the networks that it was in, mm -hmm. but just as sort of pure with collaboration, and, and you've heard me do this one before, <laughs> but, but you know, that there'd be scholars who come in and different ways, and that's a network, right. and, to, you know, and to set it up somehow so that this thing can not just be mine, uh -huh. Uh -huh. with me in charge, and this is what my computer science does again, you came up with, oh yeah, someone's gotta have some control to make sure we yeah. stuff like that. Uh -huh. But my idea was that, that you know these networky people here have all had stuff. Uh, um, you know maybe it's set up some kind of a journey yeah, entity, yeah. but that in a way then the knowledge about it will grow in ways that I would not necessarily predict. I, I think the frame there, and one of my students is doing a project that's something called the Community Archive, mm -hmm. which part of this all is about now, uh, and she's especially working with the Denver Public Library, which wants to do the history of Colorado by saying it's Colorado hey, you have something to give, come on down. And, and so you, you go to their site, and it's people, and there is some of the vets, you know, she's already had yeah, pretty boring places. <laughs> that's <laughs> fine, it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, in the Middle Ages, there's a lot of people in the Middle Ages. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, you know, somebody will post it. Yeah, so don't want to do that. exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, but that's, that's the idea, is that it's kind of this open, you know, sort of like, you know, every man a curator kind of.
very interesting there in, in terms of, you know, talking about being born in blood. What's the status of this grant now? Is it it's a it's a over. Yeah, yeah, it's done. Our, like there's some tools and documentation. The tools are there. They're downloadable. Yeah. Um, there are documents and white papers. There's mm -hmm. documents and white papers. Um, there's, I think, it's about a CA website. It's still there. It's right. Even for spatial analysis. Right. Um, has links to just about everything. Um, but, the, but the tool that, um, but the Illinois people make the I am to learn thing mm -hmm. downloadable and it has a manual, which <laughs> they didn't have when they first put us in the How do you that, use this? Is that the one for the shapes? It's for both the shapes and for the colors. And, the colors. and, the colors. and then um, there's probably something at Chef, you know, we were, we were, neither of us have talked to Mike Meredith, who is um, the computer person there, and he's just amazing. Um, but we haven't, we haven't talked to him recently, but I, I imagine that he probably has you know, his work.
produce something that will help people make that. So that, that's a sort of major for the National Archives. It's a major thing. What do we keep? What do we not keep? And how do we back up? Well, like, how do we keep it current? And so that was, I mean, that was some of the stuff that I like to just think, yeah, I don't know. But, but everything he did, he, it all built into something else. So that was one of the, the thrilling things about this Or an aspect of it would then be kind of cross walked yeah. over and utilized. Yeah, because so you would, you know, you tell them about a problem and you'd go, that's just like, and he'd tell you this computer problem and you would go, what? And then you'd describe it and you'd go, oh, it's a tiny little bit, you know, that it, it's just like. But he would, because of the way he worked on it. So when, when, when I sat down with him, you know, I copied some copies and tried to figure out what it was I did that he was interested in. Uh, it was really kind of interesting. He was sort of like a squiggly guy. You know, like a little child, you know, everybody's seen them. And so you'd be sitting there, and I'd be saying, this is what I do here. I've got some pictures. You know, this is how they work. And then he'd say, wait, so it's like stencils. You know, it's not like stencils. <laughs> <there's> variation. <laughs> so it's like, that was the beginning. It's like, you know, his frame of reference, my frame of reference. You know, no, 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 no. This art is the I draw this picture. I try to draw the picture the same. It doesn't look the same. But in, there are ways in which it is the same. You know, I write my name. I write it again. It's not the same. But you know it's my name. You know, and I signed it. And so, and so it was sort of a, you know, all time I gave kind of thing. She was So it was just me talking about that, talking about all my research, you know, everything I do. And then sort of saying, well, there's this part that for the least questions we've been looking at, you know. And then with him, it was like, here's what I'm working on. And he, was, he took me into his lab. He was doing things like, um, he was interested, that, you know, at, at Illinois they had a cave, one of those computer, really expensive computer where it's 3D immersion, you go in, and, you know, with special glasses off, and you can play basketball with some tall person, you know, and it's sort of weird. Or the art. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and it's okay. But but he was he was interested. He, he started thinking about Illinois had a really wonderful um, uh, wheelchair basketball program. I mean, Illinois was very committed to you know. The part of the history of the campus. Part of the student campus, but also, you know, every year just by the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. the wheelchair winners and the Illinois student winners won it this year. Not the wheelchair, okay. So, the, so there's this really strong commitment. And so he got interested in thinking about people in wheelchairs and wheelchair basketball, and then people who might like live in Wyoming, you know, and don't have anybody to play with in <laughs> wheelchair, wheelchair basketball, or who might not know how to do it, and, you know, if you don't have feeling, you could really hurt yourself. You know, if you're not coached well. And so he was trying to come up with this, not making a cave, but using PCs to create an immersive environment that somebody could be, you know, it could be set up in a little school in Wyoming and you could put a wheelchair person in it and a coach from Illinois could coach him mm -hmm. on movement and dribbling and you know, blocking. And, uh, and so he was doing that, but then he ended up, his mother was in computer science at Berkeley and she was involved, she was really interested in dance. And so at some point, he got dancers from Illinois and dancers, because in this immersive thing he was making that was inexpensive, it was breaking up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which visually was kind of interesting, but you, know, you could learn some things, but it wasn't like a cave. Like, hey. And so he got dancers from Illinois and dancers from Berkeley, and they danced together. And because of the way the spaces worked, they were going through each other and breaking up, and doing something, and they were like, this is so cool. <laughs> so he so, so was talking about, well, you come up with an invention for one thing, and then, oh, wait, 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 you know, and, Play, right. in a way. Um, and so it's very stimulating to talk to him because you know you'd be explaining what you do and then you'd be going choo, 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 yeah. choo, you know this is like the dancers in Berkeley. What? <laughs> you know? But but so it was it's this kind of you know thing where you find that one little you can both benefit from. And the process is just wonderful.
but even, I mean, but that worked really well. Because, you know, it's, you know, there was the relationships there. So when these papers were written, and we did, she and I did a lot of work. The relationship was good enough um, between me and you know the, the other title people, whatever, and the other schools, so the other PIs, right, yeah. OPIs, or whatever. And then between Heather and the other um, people who were doing all the work, um, you know, to, to make it the acceptable thing to realize that works the wrong way. But yeah, this is better. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess for me, because I'm so tech-phobic, you know, it's almost as though, you know, I need... But that's where the structure... The one thing that was really interesting, Peter, um, Peter B. <laughs> said to me at one point, was there was a, a, a group at uh, UT Austin, these people, uh, Jolene, um, and they got a beginning age grant to do the medieval... Global Middle Ages. Oh, it's going to be a website that's going to go across time and across space, Silk Road, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I was really, and there was a woman, Susan Mills, that Minnesota, oh, she was being there. And Gerald, oh, yeah, okay, there you go. And Gerald, right? And so, you know, I talked to Susan about it. Um, I never met Geraldine, but she had some grad students who came to a conference with Grant, so I sat down with them for a couple of hours and talked to them about their projects and what they were doing, all this sort of stuff. And I found out that they were volunteering. And so I mentioned it to Peter, and I, my colleague, you know, there's this big grant. They've, been, they've had it for two years, and there's nothing up on their website. But I talked to the grad students who are volunteering, and like, volunteering? The core thing you've got to do is pay graduate students or nothing else, you know? And, you know, and he's right, you know, because it really is, I mean, it's good training, I think. It's good exposure, but it's also, uh, you know, everybody's got so many things to do. Mm -hmm. It's the way that gets done. Mm -hmm. And it's educational. But it's also, I go back to the fact that it also, within the university setting, it has to count for something, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's, and I think that's another part of the actual struggle is getting it to translate into something that has meaning in the reward structure. And, and something that your colleagues recognize. See as best to have meaning. I was yeah. talking about the other story in Illinois, the, uh, the head of the community center there mm -hmm. had me come and put, yeah, she had like four, of us come, most of the librarians and then me. And we were supposed to talk about 10 minutes about projects we've done that were digital, you know, and so some of my colleagues came. And, you know, I did a five minute version of this. It wasn't, it didn't have the graphs or anything, it just had like little faces, you know, <laughs> and, and the little I am to learn box, and, you know, and it had the drawing of the artist who did different things. And so that's all I talked about. And um, I saw her the next day, I said, thanks so much for coming. And she looked and said, I didn't understand the word you said. And uh, you know, it was, you know, it wasn't that she was stupid. It wasn't that I was queer, but it was sort of like the mental thing. And I mean, I'm not interested in that. You know, that's not me. So, so it is, it is an interesting thing. And, and I don't know, and you know, I don't know how you do it unless. I mean, one of my my now retired, one of the eminent art historians in the U.S., Jonathan Alexander, said to me at one point, I told Heather this today too, that um, he was he was just talking about web publication. Years ago, and he said, you know, it's really up to the um, full professors to do it first. We shouldn't be making. I just published an article in a new online journal. It was rigorously, uh, you know, rigorously peer reviewed. Yeah. Stuff. I am waiting for the blowback. But, but what he said is, you know, we shouldn't be making no. untenured people do this. No, you know, they're not beginning to ask. You know, it's people who yeah. who can take a chance and then yeah. have nothing to lose. Yeah, right. you know, that have to do it. And I, I actually think that might be, you know, the way it goes with the yeah. or people have to be able to teach them. You know, PT committees who say, well, wait, that's interesting. Anyway, but that's that's one of the problems. That's like a subsidiary problem. <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the uh, I've been on groups where. Uh, we talk about wanting to allow that kind of work for promotion and tenure, but they often say, well, we don't know. Uh, we can't do it because we're not sure how to evaluate it. And so it's better not to do anything. Yeah. Do it, uh, but if you think it would be a good thing to me, I, mean, I don't know if you do a few minutes, you know, like this kind of thing is going to be the way for the future, but it's clear that there are going to be, on any level, there are going to be other areas of exploration, some of which are collaborative. I remember many, many years ago, <coughs> Of the history department that someone made a documentary film 
So I mean, when you have institutions start doing that and yeah. providing it into their yeah. training, yeah, all then, all, but then the institution is bought into it. Yeah, yeah. right. And if you know, if Harvard does it, that's right. Brandeis, Brandeis is certainly going that way too now. What Brandeis is doing that way too. Well, now that Unsworth is the head of the library oh, there, right. and he was brought in specifically to try and get digital humanities lectures up. And one of his big articles recently was specifically talking about how tool development should be put in for tenure. That 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 even even if there's not a demonstrable, you know, um, analysis that's done, but that developing these tools that can then help people should count. Mm -hmm. And that, that that's what they're pushing the mm -hmm. the direction that they're not going to go in for mm -hmm. For our history is getting institutional support from CAA. I mean, mm -hmm. they're doing a back camp. They're doing a lot more with digital humanities. The, the spatial has. training, mm -hmm. all of that incorporates digital humanities mm -hmm. into well, and here the Hall Center now has this kit that they just mm -hmm. awarded. Oh, yeah. A couple of people have this $2.7 million mm -hmm. uh, gift from the Hall family, $1 million for digital humanities postdocs position, and a million or something for a collaborative humanities. Uh, yeah, that challenge the challenge.
self-consciousness is always good in any field. <laughs> you know, what am I assuming? <laughs> you know? But yeah, that's true, too. Well, it was actually one of those things where when asked to do this, I thought about it for a while because I thought, well, really, our little thing didn't work out. But then we were talking and said, but that's okay. You know, I mean, it's, we can talk about the frame and the question. And well, what role does connoisseurship have? And yeah, right. so many mm-hmm. more traditional methods that have sort of been set aside. That how do you bring them back? What does it mean? I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that should resonate with certain mm-hmm. certain stories. Yeah. You know. And what was really interesting is that when there kind of became a recognition amongst the group that the color wasn't working, that it, they came back at us and said, "Well, how do you go about connoisseurship?" And so we sat down and went through. We did a two-page. It's like, oh my God! I mean, look at this from the outside, and then work our way in, and they ended up finding that really fascinating, and we're using it to try and think ways around what the problems yeah. were. Yeah. And that's too where you know they had to understand us. Yeah. But actually, we had to have been working together for a while for them to even you know, want to sort of say, well, what? It, you know, okay, you told me what you do, but now tell me how you do it. How you do it. Or tell Tenzing how you do it. Who is <laughs> 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 the, the graduate student in computer science? <laughs> yeah, well, this was great. Yeah, fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming down from Heather. That's okay. My sister's name is Jennifer, so I'm used to it. <laughs>